Okay, so today's announcements are a reminder that the Chapter 21 sapling is due 9 a.m. Wednesday. Um, the exam review, uh, like the last couple, is going to be Sunday, 2 to 4 p.m. in Math 100. And then the exam itself is a little over a week from today, uh, 7 to 9 p.m. in Chem 140, same as usual. Um, any questions about those? Okay, cool. Um, All righty, so... I am, oh, I guess a uh, quick note on coverage for the exam. Um, I'm on track to finish chapter 22 hopefully this week. So um, that should all hopefully be showing up on the exam. So that's the same cutoff that we had in past semesters for exam three. So they should be a pretty similar guide for how to direct your own study. Okay. Um, where we got up through last time is we're in chapter 22. And we covered a couple of reactions you can do at the alpha position. Um, so we covered proton exchange there, and we covered alpha halogenation. Um, just as kind of a quick refresher for anyone who missed that lecture, the gist is that if you make an enolate or an enol, these two things can actually go attack stuff from the carbon one away from the oxygen. So if you have some electrophile here, that kicks down, that goes out and attacks, and you end up with carbonyl with electrophile, or that kicks down, that goes out and attacks, and you end up with this thing, which you can then immediately deprotonate. So it's pretty much the same reaction overall, um, except that this one, the enolate, is what you get in base, and this one is what you get in acid. OK, so we saw a couple reactions from that chapter, or from that pattern on Friday. All right, so um, any questions about that before we start looking at a new type um, or a new example of this type. Okay, so we saw using electrophiles, we added protons there and we added halogens there. What we're going to do in this one is we're going to use a more complicated looking electrophile, but it's still the same basic deal. 
So we know that from the last few chapters, the carbon at the base of a carbonyl is pretty electrophilic. So what if we go attack another molecule at the base of its carbonyl? So let's say we start out making the enolate. Um, I'll just show that happening too, so it's all in the one place. OK, so we got this. We use base. We do protonate. Make the enolate here. So now we're ready to do this enolate goes and attacks something kind of thing. What if we then go? and attack something else. And you know what? I'm going to fill in a little bit more detail on this so it matches what I have in the notes. And I'll explain why I'm choosing these specific molecules in a second here. Um, I'm going to do this as OK. So even though most of this molecule here, um, or I'm showing some of this molecule here getting deprotonated, most of it is probably still floating around in its regular, like, not enolate form. So as soon as I make some of it into an enolate, as long as it's not, like, all getting converted to an enolate, which we can also do depending on base choice, which I'll also talk about. <laughs> but assuming that we have both the deprotonated and the regular form of the molecule floating around at the same time, I can go do this attack and go attack up on there which means that I'm actually using this to make a new carbon to carbon bond. So this is going to be very useful for building up molecules during synthesis. OK, so tracking what's going on here, I'm going to label my carbons 1, 2. We know that 2 is the one that goes and actually makes the new bond to the electrophile. So 2 here is going to be connecting onto 3, which still has 4 on it. So let's say 1, 2, three, four. Now let's keep track of what else we've got on there. So one has an oxygen on it. It's now back to being a CO double bond because that just closed back down and did the attack. Um, two doesn't have any functional groups or anything on it, but it does have the new attachment to carbon three that I just made. Meanwhile, three has just gotten attacked, which means its carbonyl is broken up to a single bond. And then 4 doesn't really have anything going on. OK, so if you're having a hard time seeing that, numbering is super helpful. Playing around with model kits might help. Um, but a lot of the success in this chapter just comes down to making sure you're tracking atoms accurately. Um, but note that when we, whenever I do this attack, I'm going to end up with two oxygens in some form um, beta to each other. So there's one carbon in between the two carbons that have bonds to O. OK, so then the last step that needs to happen is just to get it to neutral. Assuming I'm doing this in like aqueous base, I can just protonate that. OK, so that's going to be my final product for this reaction. Um, so this is, I don't remember if this is the exact molecule people first observed this on, um, but it was an aldehyde of some kind. So the product that you're making is an aldehyde with an alcohol this is called an aldol. And this reaction that I'm doing is called the aldol reaction. So we'll see this happen on other molecules, um, some of which are not actually aldehydes, but it's still called the aldol reaction just because that's where they figured it out first. OK. So it turns out there's actually two different parts to the aldol reaction. Um, what I've done here is the addition part of the aldol reaction. So you could also describe this as aldol addition to here. Um, turns out under some circumstances, um, which I'll also discuss in a little bit, you can actually keep going and do something else on here. So um, it is possible to have some other molecule come in and attack this aldehyde, but I'm, for the purposes of simplicity, going to sort of stop at two molecules getting together. 
Um, you can sort of control that with stoichiometry. Um, but the one other thing that can happen to this specific molecule that I just made is that we can actually do something else to these functional groups. So this is particularly favored in heat. Um, So we can make one more change to this molecule. And this is going to be sort of similar in some ways to eliminations that we've seen in the past, but significantly different in a couple of ways. Um, so OK, so we've got this molecule that we just made. Um, it still has these hydrogens here. We still have base around. This could still go get deprotonated, kind of like we did on the first step up here. And we could make an enolate like this. The big difference is when we do this, we're actually one away from something that's not a great leaving group, but it's not any worse than the base that we already have floating around. Um, so at this point, we can actually do not exactly like an enolate attacking something so much as an enolate coming back down, kicking over, and booting out an OH group. So if we're doing this in heat, we're actually going to get this alkene aldehyde thing. Um, it doesn't have a cool name like aldol does, but it's kind of um, formed from the aldol product, though. OK, so this is called the aldol condensation. Um, and a lot of the time, um, I don't remember if we've seen any particular reactions that are called condensations before, but kind of the key trend there is you're kicking out a small molecule um, from the main molecule. So in this case, you're overall losing a molecule of water. Okay. So aldol addition and aldol condensation are the two parts of aldol reaction but you won't always get both of them happening. Like if it's at low temperature, you might just get the aldol addition. If it's at higher temperature, you might shoot straight through all the way to the condensation product. Uh-huh. Why when you use the second part, why can't you just hold the hydrogen bonds straight into your alcohol? Ah, excellent question. So um, that's actually what I'm going to talk about next is what's going on with this mechanism and why does it look so weird? Yep. <laughs> so. Um, so this mechanism overall, if you look at it, like what we're accomplishing is kind of the same as like E1 or E2. Um, but it's not actually either of those. So E1, if you remember, leaving group drops off first, then the proton gets pulled off. Um, it's also not E2, which, if you remember, has both of those steps happening at once. So this is the first case we've seen of, like, the other way around, the proton first, and then the leaving group goes. So this is actually called E1CB for E1 conjugate base. <laughs> I guess it's lowercase actually. So E subscript lower uh, subscript one lowercase CB. So this is the first case we've seen where the H actually gets pulled off first and then the leaving group goes. And the reason why this happens here, but not anywhere else that we've looked at, is because, 
I guess if you think about it, like an alkyl halide, um, say like from OCHEM1, if we tried doing that there, say we tried doing E1CB on an alkyl halide, we might end up getting something that looks like proton first, and we would be making a C with a minus charge, which we know is not real great as far as pKa values. Like this is pKa in the mid-teens, this is pKa in probably like the 60-somethings. So the reason why this doesn't happen here, but it does happen up here, is because um, we're a lot better able to accommodate a negative charge on these molecules up here. We already know we can make enolates reasonably easily, and it's just, it turns out that making the enolate is actually faster and more stable than trying to do E1 or E2 on this molecule. It's just really easy to deprotonate in a way that alkyl halides wouldn't be. So, okay, um, so questions about that? Yeah. Um, there are, yep, yeah, so um, usually if we're doing this in the enolate form, um, it's going to be in base, so kind of the, let me actually do the overall reaction down here. So um, I'm doing this all in base right now. We also are going to look at the acid version in a second here. So for base catalyzed aldol, we're just going to take whatever molecule we're doing this to. And usually, it's going to be just like H2O and OH minus. Gives us the aldol addition product. And then if you add heat, you can Get to the condensation product, or if you just lump everything onto the one arrow, base and water, and we're heating it at the same time, you're just going to go shooting straight to the final product there, which you could also just show as a one-step thing. You don't have to split it up. Okay. Um, so questions about that? Yeah. Ah, um, good question. We're going to look at that in a little bit, like five or ten minutes. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot of details that we're mostly going to spend today on for this reaction, so, yeah. Okay, um, other questions about this one? Okay, cool. So, um, Um, so one other case where we're actually going to see condensation, whether heat's written or not, um, you can actually get it going whether uh, if you don't heat the reaction up, so long as the molecule has some big sort of motivation for forming a double bond. Um, So usually the cases where that comes up is in terms of conjugation. Um, so I don't think I drew this molecule or this example specifically in the notes, but if we were looking at something like uh, that's gonna work. Okay, so we're looking at this thing. Um, so a phenyl ring hanging off of the alpha carbon. Um, if we do this, then We're going to have that once it attacks another copy of itself. But if we do the condensation at this point, hmm. 
then we're making something where we have an aromatic ring conjugated into the alkene. And it turns out that is actually enough of a driving force that this will actually favor condensation even if it's not being heated up specifically. In fact, um, I think you have to keep it pretty cold in order to stop it from going all the way to the condensation product. <laughs> so at room temperature, it's just going to go shooting straight through to the end. Okay. Um, questions about that one? Yeah. How is that more stable? Because I think that the final ring will keep their aromaticity so it's probably just high bonding. Um, so I guess like even if you're not explicitly showing resonance forms of like plus and minus charges going on, um, there's still sort of um, just more conjugated ends up being more stable. Um, the reasons for that basically come down to PCM. It turns out like the bigger a space you give an electron to run around in, the more stable and lower energy it is. Um, so yeah, we've only sort of like just given that as a rule without actually explaining why, but yeah, it turns out just a more extensive conjugation is more stable. So. Okay. Isn't <laughs> All right. Um, so this is all for the base catalyzed version. Oh, question. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, good question. I think that actually ties into the question someone else asked about, can you do this on ketones as well, which you sort of can, but it gets complicated. So I'll cover that a little bit later on in today's lecture. Yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, so let me do the acid version first, and then we'll start looking at how to start to play into this, and how can you use them to your advantage. OK, so if we're doing this in acid, then we're going to attack with the enol instead, pretty much exactly like that summary I showed up there. OK, so if we're using the same molecule again, all right, I'm not going to show the enol formation steps um, just to save some space on here. You guys should know that by now. <laughs> okay. Um, also, since we're an acid, what are we going to do to the molecule that gets attacked to make it look more electrophilic? Protonate. Yep. So we're going to protonate this guy first to make it look like a more enticing target. So we've got the enol which is not as good a nucleophile as the enolate was over here in base, but it can still do something. But we're sort of making this thing look more attackable by having it be protonated first. OK, so that kicks down, that attacks. So all of the actual like bond forming is exactly the same as in base. You just got more protons around while it's happening. OK, so that gets us to here. And then we just need to deprotonate this thing. OK, so same results. Um, but as it turns out in acid here, we're not going to do E1CB because we don't have any base around to make the conjugate base. Um, So from here, in acid, the condensation just looks exactly like an acid-catalyzed alcohol dehydration. So E1, in other words, we've got acid around. We're going to protonate that OH group to turn it into a good leaving group. gets us to here. And then um, that can just drop off. Okay. 
and then something can come take this proton. Okay. So we're going to the same place overall, first the addition and then the condensation product. But it turns out because we're in acid and we know that this is a reaction that's been fairly easy in the past for alcohols, um, there's no stopping this one at the midway mark. It's just going to go straight to the condensation products, whether you heat it or not. Um, I think even if you do this at low temperature, you have to cool it down pretty far, I think, before it actually will stop trying to do this. So. In base, you can choose to stop part way or not, depending on conditions, so long as your molecule isn't just gung-ho about going all the way to the alkene. Um, but in acid, it's always going to stop here. It just automatically does the condensation. OK. So questions about those two sort of flip sides of the same reaction, basically? OK, cool. So now getting back to the questions that people asked about sterics and aldehydes versus ketones. Um, this actually ties into reversibility, in fact. So so it's actually reversible in both acid and base. For both of these things, um, you can help to drive the equilibrium towards products a little bit. Um, but a lot of it kind of depends on how willing the molecules are to team up um, to dimerize by doing aldol onto each other. Um, so aldehydes, as it turns out, favor products. Um, Ketones actually favor the starting material due to sterics. Okay, so if we have like two copies of an aldehyde here, um, going to draw an equilibrium arrow that favors the right side. But if we try doing this on almost the same molecule, only it's got a methyl instead of an H out on the left. It's actually going to not want to do this reaction most of the time. And the reason for that is actually really similar to what we saw in chapter 19. If you guys remember making hydrates, that was an equilibrium reaction where, um, let me put that back up real quick for comparison. Or if you've got like a ketone, it can do this hydrate thing, but it's not going to really like spending much time here because the sterics around an sp3 carbon are not that great if it's got a couple of alkyl groups on it. Whereas if it just stays sp2, it's going to be more comfortable. Um, same thing here for this one carbon that gets attacked. Like, it's not really enjoying being sp3 when it's got all these R groups attached to it, if it can avoid it by staying a carbonyl. OK, I think I saw a hand come up a little while ago. No? All right. <laughs> Maybe I addressed it already. Um, mm -hmm. OK. Um, actually, any other questions about sort of this equilibrium? Because we can actually take advantage of this really usefully, it turns out. Yep. So they do the reverse reaction, are there mm -hmm. Um, yep, same reagents as we did for the Ford reaction, actually. So in fact, if we um, this is actually called retroaldol. Um, I don't think they like specifically show it happening in the book, but it's always a possibility. Um, where like if we give you, say, that ketone product,
and then say H2O and OH minus, for example, the same conditions that would have made the aldol in the first place, is just going to fall back apart into two of the starting material. Yeah, and um, that might actually not be a bad sort of way to practice the mechanism is if you're trying to figure out the reverse mechanism for like going backwards, it's going to hit every same key intermediate as it did on the way forwards. That's called the principle of microscopic reversibility. Um, but just the arrow pushing is going to look different as you're backing out of the product. So, yeah. Yeah, good question. So, um, yeah, basically, it turns out we have other workarounds for making this happen in like a non-equilibrium way that we'll cover later as well. But you could still make this by other means. And then as soon as you put it into conditions that allow it to like equilibrate between the aldol product and the starting material, it's going to just drop straight back to the starting material if you're not careful. Yeah. OK. So this is actually kind of useful to know because it turns out that um, you can actually do this reaction on two molecules that are not identical copies of the same starting material. So I'm going to box this up and go over here. Um, Um, the problem is that if you set it up so that they're both equally likely to make the enolate and they're both equally likely to get attacked by an enolate, then you really have zero control over how things are going to go. Um, so if both can make the enolate and both can get attacked, by the enolate. Then we have four different products that we can make just by focusing on addition only. Like if we bring condensation, then we have eight different products we can make. So let's say we're doing Okay, I'm just going to show this as a phenyl because I don't want to draw it an aromatic ring every time. But I'm going to call these A and B. Okay, so I got A with a phenyl. I've got B with this um, isopropyl group coming off of its alpha carbon. Um, they're both totally capable of making an enolate and because they're both aldehydes, they're both totally capable of getting attacked by an enolate. So I could have four different things coming out of this. Um, I'm going to draw up the basic skeleton of an aldol product first and then flesh in the details based on what happens. So for all of them, they're going to have the same kind of core thing going on of this. Okay, so that's like the same central part that I was getting from like doing this on simpler molecules. But I'm going to have one copy of product for A attacks A. So that means that the one that was the enolate, the one that is now back to having a carbonyl, has a phenyl. And also the one that got attacked, the one that now has an OH on it, also has a phenyl. Um, I could also have A attacks B. So this side that used to be the enolate has a phenyl. And this side, the side that has an OH, the side that got attacked, has that isopropyl group on it. Um, or I could have B attacked A. So now this side used to be the enolate, and this side has the phenyl. 
or I could have b attacks b. So they're both isopropyl groups coming off of there. Okay, so this is obviously very useless and messy to actually do in a lab. Um, there's no point. I mean, you're getting like four pretty chemically similar ones, like good luck separating those on a column. Um, so we can minimize this happening if we sort of are choosier about our molecules. So we don't want both of them to be able to be an enolate. We just want one of them to be capable of being an enolate. And we just want one of them to be easily attackable. Oh, and there's one other thing that I didn't even mention yet, and that is, well, I'll get into that in a little bit, but it turns out, um, kind of like we saw last time, if you have a molecule where either side of the carbonyl can make an enolate, and they could both get deprotonated and make different enolates that way, then you can attack from either side. And so that's like another source of possible products. But we'll do some examples of how to control that later on. Okay. So to avoid this mess, make sure that only one molecule can make the enolate. and only one molecule that's easily attackable, so an aldehyde, in other words. Okay. So usually your combo is going to be something like this, where we have A here and B here. All right, so only A is capable of even making an enolate. It's the only one that has alpha hydrogens. Um, and just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, this one does not have any alpha hydrogens. The aldehyde thing is not attached to an alpha carbon. It's on the carbonyl itself. And over here, we don't have anything because this carbon already has four bonds to carbon. So this one cannot ever make an alpha, or uh, cannot ever make an enolate. Um, so this is the one that's going to get attacked. Um, and over here on A, this one has got a bunch of alpha protons that are convenient and just as good luck because it's symmetrical. It doesn't matter which side I even take it from. I could take them from the left or the right and it would still make the same thing. Um, so there's lots of alpha hydrogens. They're all symmetrical to each other, fortunately. And also, this is a ketone, so it's not likely to go attack another copy of itself because um, sterics would kind of get in the way. So not very electrophilic or not very attackable. Okay, so this is going to be a pretty good setup. Our only option really is A attacks B. So if you want to go through and practice the mechanism for that on your own, make the enolate here, send it to go attack B. Or you could just pretty much start out with that simplest possible version of the product that I drew over there and fill in the details. Um, and again, numbering helps to keep track. But that would get us to here. And because we happen to be making something where there's an aromatic ring that's one away from where a double bond would form. This one, as it turns out, is going to just go straight to the condensation product as well. Okay, so doing things in this way where we're limiting the options for both molecules and they both have clearly defined roles, um, actually ended up being enough of a big deal that the people who discovered how to set this up had their names attached to it. So this is called 
Claisen-Schmidt condensation. Um, but really, it's just a specific subtype of aldol. It's just a clever way of setting up aldol. So if you just call this aldol, that's fine too. Okay. Um, questions about that one? Yep. Mm, um, because again, we've got this whole conjugated part going on if we do that. And so having the alkene and the aromatic ring together kind of forces it to go along. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions about this? Yeah. How much conjugation do you need? Like, can we have like a five ring or something as well? Ooh. Um, so I guess the examples I've seen were all just regular like fennel rings. Um, yeah, I don't know actually where the cutoff would be, but. That's pretty much the only case that I'm going to have it be relevant to. So, yep. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, in the notes I left one other sentence at the end of this paragraph that says there are other workarounds to getting crossed aldols to work that we don't get into. And then I immediately get into it in the next paragraph because I updated my notes and forgot to remove that sentence. So we will be covering other ways to make this work in a realistic way. Okay, so, um, oh, I don't think I explicitly put the name of what we're trying to do here. So this is a crossed aldol reaction. Anything that involves two different molecules getting together So crossed aldol is kind of tricky if you try just like doing it the old school way. Um, people found a way to make it work, but that's really only a good choice if you happen to be lucky enough that your products um, can be made with this sort of pairing of stuff. Um, turns out that with more advanced stuff, we can actually get crossed aldols going on in a much more controlled way that doesn't give us this whole mess of stuff. Um, so. Pretty much it comes down to use a very specifically chosen base. All right, so we need it to be bulky so it's not going to get any ideas and try going attacking the carbonyl on its own. Um, normally when I say strong bit bulky base, you think what? <laughs> yeah, terbutoxide. Um, turns out that's not actually quite strong enough to do this very well. Um, the pK of the enolate proton is usually a little bit higher than terp-butoxide, so we're going to have to bump things up a little bit. Um, and so this is where, oh here, um, LDA is going to show up a lot. So LDA is lithium diisopropyl. <laughs> Okay, so it's called amide, um, which is normally used to describe a carbonyl on a nitrogen. Um, confusingly, that is also used to describe a nitrogen with a negative charge. Um, the naming is kind of a holdover from people thought this was something that like went and attacked the carbonyl and you know you sort of treat it as like its own group on there as if it were a negative charge section, but um, Everyone just calls it LDA anyway. Um, <laughs> so it's nitrogen with a negative charge, two isopropyl groups on there to get the sterics sort of good and bulky. And then um, the pK of this is usually about 35. Okay, so this is strong enough to make the enolate. Um, in a way that's essentially irreversible um, or very strongly favored. So if we have a 
say this aldehyde here, usually on an aldehyde or a ketone, the pK of the alpha proton is going to be about 17-ish to 20. This is why we couldn't use tert butoxide. Tert butoxide is about 18-ish, um, which is not good enough to get all of these molecules to deprotonate. Um, if we hit this thing with LDA, then we're going to make the enolate um, in sort of a non-equilibrium way. Like essentially 100% of the molecules are going to form the enolate. which, so long as we added enough LDA to be more than one equivalent, means that this thing doesn't really have anything left to attack. Like, it can't do an aldol reaction on another copy of itself because there are no other copies of itself left in their original form. Everything's gotten converted to the enolate. Okay, um, so the way that we could take advantage of this, say with these two molecules over here, A and B, is we can do Whichever one we want to make the enolate, let's say we're trying to have A making the enolate doing the attack. What we do is expose A to our base first, LDA. We make the enolate first, and then as like a step two, we add our B molecule, um, the same one over there. Uh, so pretty much only A can do the attack because it's the only one that's the enolate, and only B at this point can get attacked because it's the only thing left floating around in its neutral non-enolate form. So A attacks B is now the only option that we're going to leave these molecules, and that's the only product that we're going to get. Okay, so overall you could write this thing as you can actually just combine these steps onto the one arrow as long as you're using numbered steps. So step one, hit it with LDA. Step two, hit it with the other carbonyl that you want it to react with. And then um, because we're not doing this in a protic solvent and we can't actually, we're going to get stuck with an O minus afterwards, we would need to do H3O plus to finish it up. Um, sorry, I saw a hand go up. Uh -huh. um, because this thing, um, assuming that we get the stoichiometry on LDA right, there's no um, base left around to actually deprotonate this thing. And so um, it's pretty much like this is getting stuck in the carbonyl form. This is already in the enolate form. So the fastest option is just this goes and attacks that. Yeah. OK. So you can actually write one of the other carbonyl molecules on the arrow as a reagent and then just go straight to the products after that. OK, so there are some caveats about this that I'll cover next time. Um, but LDA, like that really opened up a lot of options for aldol chemistry.